So welcome to NOAA Live Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This is the second webinar in a series that we designed to help you get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals to live, that live all around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. Today, we're introducing you to Aaron Fidua and Leah Zacher from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center's Kodiak Lab in Kodiak, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. NOAA respectful, respectfully acknowledges that Kodiak Island is a Alutic Sudkiet homeland. We thank and acknowledge the tribes of the Kodiak Alutic region. The heritage and culture, culture of the Alutic people continue to enrich the community. We'd also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everyone can hear our speakers. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I'll be keeping track for Aaron and Leah. They'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I think I've done enough talking now, so I'll hand it over to Aaron and Leah to introduce themselves. And there we go. Okay, I'm gonna turn myself off now. Hi, everyone. We're so happy to be with you today. My name's Aaron, And I'm Leah, and we're both fisheries biologists at the Kodiak Laboratory. So before we start, we just wanna spend a couple minutes sharing how we got to where we are. Um, when I was little, I grew up on the back of a horse on a farm in the Midwest. And I didn't know that I wanted to be a fisheries biologist until I saw the ocean for the first time when I was 13. So now I live up in Alaska and I study snow crab. And so when I was growing up in California, I loved all different types of animals and plants, but I also didn't know I wanted to be a fisheries biologist until I moved up to Alaska, and now I study the movement of red king crabs. So I don't know about you guys, but I love to play guessing games. Today, we're going to play a guessing game to try to figure out who our first guest star will be. I'm going to give you guys a series of clues and we're going to talk a little bit about the clues and then at the very end you can submit all your guesses for who you think the guest star would be so make sure you don't type in your answers before because you don't want to see what anyone else's guess is so our first clue is that our guest star is an invertebrate so i want everyone to reach around and touch your backbone right now so we have a backbone, an invertebrate does not have a backbone. So when we think of animals, organisms that don't have a backbone, we could think of something that's kind of squishy like a worm, or our second clue, we could think of an animal that has an exoskeleton. So their skeletal system is on the outside of their body, like say an insect that has kind of a, a hard outside versus us, if everyone holds up their arm, we have hair, we have skin, and then our bones. So our third clue is that our guest star is bilaterally symmetrical. If something is symmetrical, it means it looks the same on both sides. So think about you looking at yourself in the mirror. If an animal is bilaterally symmetrical, you can just split them in half and it looks the same on both sides. And our fourth clue is that our guest star is found in subpolar waters in both the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. So that, that yellow star, I just wanna give our Kodiak kids a shout out that are listening today. 
Um, you can see where we are here at the Kodiak Lab and our population that we study of our guest star is in that, that yellow circle in the Bering Sea. Our fifth clue is that our guest star has greenish colored eyes. So hopefully you guys are thinking hard right now. Lisa, do we have any guesses about who our first guest star is? So we've got a lot of people starting to type in their guesses for what they think it is. Meg was asking, is it a crab? And Miss Hemphill's Ooh. class has several guesses. Um, some people are saying spider crab. Some people are saying king crab. Um, Wesley wow. says maybe it's a snow crab. Um, a lot of people are just saying crab. Um, so yeah. what, do you, what do you think? Yes. Yeah, so. Our first guest, I'm gonna pull him out, is the snow crab. So whoever, he's trying to pinch me too. Whoever guessed snow crab, give yourselves a pat on the back. Those were awesome guesses. So this is a snow crab. I'm gonna show him and make sure he doesn't pinch me because I'm sure you guys are a lot of, are wondering if I've ever gotten pinched and I definitely have. <laughs> So you can see, I'm gonna hold up two snow crab and give you guys a clue. One is a male and one is a female. Can you guys type in what you think some differences between these crab are? And we'll try to figure out which one is a male and which one is a female. All right, so for those of you who have your question boxes and your typing fingers ready, if you look at those two crabs that Aaron is holding up and say, what do you think the difference is between the male and the female? Um, and maybe which one do you think is the male and which one do you think is a female? So we've got some guesses that say the bigger one is a male. Um, some are saying that the claw, the claw length is different. Uh, Michelle yeah. is saying that one has eggs. Um, Cunio says that the top is the female, the bottom is the male. Um, Mr. Ramsey's class is saying the female is the bigger one. So we've got a couple of different votes there. Um, and we have Joe, Mr. Ward's class is saying size, the shape, the bottom of their shells. Um, and so we, and then um, Jacob is saying the length of the legs and the size of the pinchers is different. Yeah, so. awesome. You guys are so smart. You should be standing up here. So the male snow crab is the bigger one. So some of you guys mentioned that snow crab, the males are always bigger than the females when they're mature. And you can see this big male. So someone mentioned that he's got these nice big claws. See that? And he's much larger than the female. So I'll hold her up again. She's trying to escape on us. And one thing that some of you mentioned is their, their little stomachs or what we call their abdomen flaps. So if you guys can see that on the bottom here, the male always has this triangular shaped abdomen flap. Whereas the female, if someone mentioned this, the female has a big circular kind of oval shaped abdomen flap because that's where she stores her eggs. So she needs that large abdomen flap to keep her eggs safe. So males are always bigger and males have this triangular shaped abdomen flap. So I'm gonna hold this guy up and we're gonna just do some, look at some observations of his, he's gonna try to page me, <laughs> of his claws that he's waving right now. Do you guys see those teeth that are on each of his claws? So he's got little ridges on each of his claws that he might be able to use to crack really hard things open. And you'll also notice he's moving around his mouth parts. So snow crab have really cool mouth parts. They actually have three sets of jaws and they can use those to kind of funnel in food. So what do you guys think snow crab eat based on what we just talked about? If you want to go ahead and type in some guesses as to what these guys might eat with those claws and all those mouth parts. So go ahead guess and type into your, your question box what you think the crab, that snow crabs eat. So Josh is saying that he thinks that they eat shrimp. Um, Isabella says food. That's pretty general, but yeah. 
Sloan says plankton. Meg says hard shells. Um, Cheryl says fish or snails. Sloan says fish. Oh, I think, yeah. So, um, and then Anduin says clams. Josh is saying small fish. Uh, Jacob says phytoplankton. Renee said small fish and shrimp plants. Um, Sarah is saying clams. So lots of clams and mussels, smaller invertebrates awesome. than fish. Um, somebody said, oh, Josh said oyster. Katya said each other. Yeah, <laughs> something that's a great interesting, huh? <laughs> Sloan said mud snails. And um, so that's where we have it for now. Yeah, so I love that you that a lot of you guys guessed cells, right? Because we talked about these big, strong claws that they have, and that's exactly what they can use these claws for. So as you can see on this dinner plate, that was kind of a trick question because snow crab eat pretty much everything. We call them generalists, meaning that they are scavengers and they'll eat, I think someone said dead fish. They'll eat pretty much anything that they can find on the ocean floor that looks tasty for them. And there, these claws especially are made to crack open some of those shells that you guys were talking about. So great guesses. Okay. So I'm gonna hold these guys back up. And does anyone have any questions? Well, let's see. So um, I think if you can turn off the slides, we can see the crabs up closer. Um, Eve had wanted to know why are they called snow crabs? Ooh, good question. So they're called snow crab because um, remember when I showed you guys that map when it first popped up, they're found in cold water. So snow crab like really cold water. So I think maybe they just thought that snow crab was a fitting name because they live in those, those subpolar waters. And then Josh was asking, how long do they live? Ooh, that's a good question too. Do you guys know? Yeah, well, so so I just asked my friends because that's a great question. I don't even know. But um, a good point was made that we can't actually age crab. So we can use um, like ear bones of fish or we can ask each other how old we are, but we can't actually age a crab. So we actually don't know how long they live until they die. That's a great question. You almost sent me. <laughs> So Mrs. Hemphill's class was asking, why do crabs lay eggs? Are they bugs? Ooh, why do crabs lay eggs? That's also a good question. So crab, basically, they, um, they hold their eggs in their abdomen, like I mentioned, um, to allow the embryos to develop. So some, some fish have no, what we call no parental care. They don't take care of their babies at all. Whereas crab, actually, they'll extrude their eggs in this clutch so that the embryos can develop and they can keep them safe right in their abdomen. And then they can hatch and then they're on their own. That was a great question too. So um, Miss, Mrs. Blewett's class had wanted to know, how do they breathe underwater? Oh, that's a great question. So you'll see it in a section we have coming up in a bit more detail, but crab have gills just like fish. So, so we have lungs that we can pull oxygen from the air. Crab have gills and they actually use their gills to pull oxygen from the water. And we'll see some of that in a little bit when we do a dissection. Okay, um, oh, and Sloan had wanted to know where are the ears? Where are the ears? So crab don't, they don't really have ears like we do. So they don't rely on hearing. They use, so they'll use um, their mouth parts to kind of um, smell. So they, they rely on smell a lot more than hearing. So they don't have ears like us. Okay. You guys great. are asking some good questions. And then two more before we move on. Um, Sloan had wanted, Sloan and I think Sloan had wanted to know what is the maximum size and what is the maximum age? You already talked about age a little bit that we don't really know how to age crab, but how, um, how big do they get? Good question. Yeah, so this male, so our, the snow crab that you're used to eating are quite a bit bigger than this guy. So he's, he's what we call mature and he's got a nice clean shell. So this, this is 
close to the snow crab that we eat, but they get they get quite a bit bigger. So not not near as big as the next crab you'll see, but they get bigger than this. Not much bigger. All right. Well, I think that's a probably a pretty good segue to our next section. So I know that there are a few questions more, but I think that we if we move on to the next section, then we can answer some of those questions once we get to that. Yeah, thanks guys. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Leah and she's gonna talk about our next species. Thank you. So next I'm going to be introducing you to red king crab, which is another of our species of Alaskan crab. So red king crab live in similar areas to, to snow crab. They live in the North Pacific Ocean. They don't, don't live quite as far north as snow crab. So they live throughout um, some of the Northern Canadian waters throughout Alaska and then over into Russian waters. And on the map, you see that red star, that's where we are here in the lab in Kodiak. We do have some king crab here, but the biggest populations in Alaska are currently in a couple of our bays which are Norton Sound and Bristol Bay. So now let's take a look at our red king crab. And I want you to look closely at this crab and so that you can see um, all the different parts of this crab. And I'd like you, to, as I show it to you different sides, think about some differences between the red king crab and the snow crab. And why don't you write down just one difference that you, you notice between a king crab and a snow crab. Okay, so what I'm seeing is Wesley says that it's bigger. Josh is saying that the red king crab is spiky. Meg is also saying it's bumpy. Um, and Katya and Jacob also say that it's, it's spiky. Um, let's see. Sarah is saying that they're bigger and have bigger spikes. So a lot of people are, are noticing the spikes and the spines. And then Mrs. Blewett's class says that the colors are different. And Sloan says that there is a different shape. Um, Mrs. Yeah, those are all also really said good. that they have bigger claws. Yeah, those are all really good answers. And those are all things that we see different between the king crab and the snow crabs. Um, they are definitely much more spiky. That's why I'm wearing gloves and Aaron wasn't, um, because they're pretty pokey to hold with your bare hands. One thing that I really noticed that the difference between a king crab and a snow crab is actually the number of legs. So if we look at the number of walking legs. We can see on each side the snow crab has, or sorry, the king crab have three walking legs and then one claw, the kila, on each side. Whereas the snow crab you were just looking at has one, two, three, four walking legs on each side plus the claw. So it's a different number of legs. And actually, the number of legs on a crab are really important because what we call true crabs, like snow crabs, all have four walking legs on each side plus the claw. Whereas some other crabs that aren't really actually considered true crabs are like the king crab don't have as many legs that they walk on. King crabs are actually not very closely related to snow crabs. They're actually a lot more closely related to another crab you might be familiar with, you may have seen at the beach, the hermit crabs. So hermit crabs, um, you can see this one is being pretty shy. You see its big claw right there and they live inside snail shells um, just for protection. If I can hold up a different one, see if he wants to. This one's showing some of it. It's also being shy, but it shows some how it's pulled into this clam shell, or sorry, a snail shell for protection. And hermit crabs also don't have, um, they don't have four walking legs on each side, just like the king crab. Also, hermit crabs have a very coiled body. It's coiled back to hold them in that snail shell. Whereas, um, and so they're not bilaterally symmetrical. Like Aaron talked about that the snow crabs look exactly the same on both sides. And that's actually another hint that a king crab is more closely related to a hermit crab, which doesn't seem obvious than a 
than a snow crab because it's actually not bilaterally symmetrical. On the top, it looks bilaterally symmetrical, but if you look at the bottom, if you look at these big plates on the bottom here, you can see they're not identical on both sides. The ones over here are much wider and the ones over here are smaller. So it's not exactly the same on both sides. Okay, so now um, Aaron showed you the difference between a male and female snow crab. So let, who, um, why don't you guys tell me what um, sex you think this king crab is? You can write in so, that answer. Yeah, so if you want to answer in your answer box whether you think that this crab is a male or a female, and maybe why you think it's a female or a male, um, then we can we can look at that. So let's see what question, what answers we have. So a lot of people are saying um, that it's a male. Some are saying this feel it looks like it's about split evenly between male and female. I wonder whether that's because the size is so big. Um, Mrs. Blewett's class says that it's female because of the hump on its back. Um, Josh says it's male because it's bigger. So it looks like it's about evenly split between male and female that people are, are, are typing in. Okay, you're right. This is a really big crab. Um, and males and king crabs do tend to get a little bit bigger than females, but this one actually is a female. And if I pull down this big flap, look, there are her, are her eggs. So now we know it's a female because males don't carry eggs. So this big brown mass that's thousands of eggs in there that, that this female is carrying. And the females, just like in the snow crabs, they have a much bigger flap or abdomen on the bottom because they have to be able to carry those eggs. I'll get out a male now. This male is supposed to be small, but that doesn't mean all king crab males are small. This, that's just the one that we have right here. So this is a male, and if we look at the flap on the bottom here, it's much harder to pull out. I can't really get my finger under it and it's triangular shaped. And that wouldn't be able to hold as many eggs, which is good because he doesn't have eggs because he's a male. So that's how we tend to tell, the easiest way to tell the difference between a male and female um, king crab, which is fairly similar for, for all crabs. Okay, so now we are going to think about what, how a crab can grow. And this really applies to all types of crab, but we're gonna specifically look at it for king crab. Now, Aaron talked about that crab have an exoskeleton. So their skeleton is on the outside. It's this hard, hard layer on the outside of their body, which is really good for protection, but it also makes it very difficult for, difficult for them to grow. Because think about if you were living inside, say a cardboard box, if your skeleton was on the outside, how would you grow? You can't grow because you have this hard layer on the outside. So crabs have to go through a process called molting where they shed that outer layer and they can grow up to a new bigger size, puff themselves up and then form a new skeleton. So they basically have to shed their skeleton all the time, every time they want to grow. And that's called molting. So we're going to look at a quick video of a crab molting. I'm just going to let you look at it first. Okay, now you saw how the crab backed out of its old shell. Now we're actually going to play that video one more time because I think it's really neat to be able to see and focus on what is happening. So in the first picture, the crab is just starting to back out of its shell. Um, and you see it's gotten one of its back legs free in the lower, in the bottom. Uh, it's backing out further and further, but the rest of the legs are actually still stuck in the mold. So we call this process molting, and then after the crab is backed out of the shell, the old shell that's left over is called the molt. And if we felt that crab that just molted, it would actually feel like jello, because it actually takes a couple days for them to harden up their new skeleton that's on the outside. 
And we actually have a few crab molts for you to look at here. Um, so we can see we had some crabs in the lab that molted several times. And this is just the old shell this crab is. Molt of its shell. And so we can see how it went from one size to then growing up to a larger size. And then even it molted again and grew up to an even larger size. So these are the molts of the crab. So on the, when you go, when you get to go to the beach, you may find what looks like a dead crab, but it's probably not a dead crab. It's probably just the molt. So now I would, does anyone have any questions about king crab? So um, Leah, we did have some questions about the red king crab and actually from Facebook, Lily and Ella are watching live streaming on Facebook and they were wondering, what is the red thing on the snow crab? Oh, that red um, thing on the snow crab, that was actually a tag that we put um, on them in the lab so we can identify and keep track of individual animals. Uh, because they're, they can be hard to tell apart. They don't have such interesting facial features as we do. So okay. we want to make sure they track them too soon. Great. And then um, Bree was wondering, why is the red king crab so big? We're getting a little bit of audio feedback from you. So I'm going to mute really quick to see whether that will make a difference. OK, so Bree was wondering, why is the red king crab so big? Red king crabs, um, they, I mean, there's not a good answer for that necessarily because any animal um, it's that big, but they, they can get big because that's the habitat that they live in and that's how they have evolved um, to, to live. Um, but uh, that is, yeah, I don't have a specific answer on why they can get them. And then um, Mary was wondering, do we eat red king crab? And I think that a lot of people know the answer to that one. I bet a lot of people know that. And I bet a lot of people have tried them. We definitely eat red king crab. We only um, harvest the male red king crab so that the females are left to um, be able to reproduce and release their eggs. But we, we definitely eat red king crab. And it's one of our biggest fisheries up here in Alaska is red king crab fishery. Great. Um, let's see. So then another question is, um, how big can a king crab grow? King crab can grow, I would say, let's look at her. So a king crab can grow probably about twice as big as her, a big male. Um, so they they can easily be um, ten pounds of big male crab. Any other questions? We're getting a little bit of audio feedback from your um, from your audio. I'm wondering whether if you mute and then come back on again, that that would keep it. But in the meantime. Um, Mr. Ward was actually, class was actually ask, asking, are crabs in greater danger from predators when they molt? That is a really good question. Yes, crabs are very vulnerable to predators when they molt. King crabs are so big that when they're not molting and they have that hard exoskeleton, they don't have many predators, but when they molt, they're very vulnerable, especially for the first couple days when their skin is so soft and they get eaten by lots of fish, they can get eaten by other king crab. <laughs> yeah, that can be very dangerous. So just before we move on to the next section, we had a couple of questions. Mr. Ward's class was wondering, our uh, sorry, that we just answered that one. We, Ayla was wondering, um, why is the crab so pokey? And a lot of people were wondering why red king crabs are so spiky and whether being spiky makes it easier for them to be caught or maybe, maybe makes it harder for them to be caught. We weren't sure which. 
Being really spiny is a good protection. It's hard for other animals to be able to eat them and swallow them. When they, even if a fish could, was big enough that it could get its mouth around a king crab, all those spines are going to help protect it. Okay, and then one last question before we, we move on. Um, Mary was wondering what eats crabs, because we were talking about how crabs are in greater danger from predators when they molt, but she was curious what actually eats them. That's a great question. Um, some of the biggest predators of crabs are certainly when the crab is molting, they'll be eaten by fish like cod or halibut. And, any, and if they happen to be near shore, which they, they aren't that close to shore, but for example, a sea otter could eat a king crab if it was near shore, um, if it was in shallow enough water, which does happen sometimes. Okay, great. So maybe we could move on to the next section and then see what we get from there. Okay, great, thank you. And next, Erin is going to be going back to the snow crab and doing a dissection for you. All right, hi guys. So we talked a lot about crab. You guys should be experts now, but we're gonna look inside a crab. So we're going to do some internal dissection and learn about their anatomy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the video now for you, Erin, and we will see how things go. So um, you're going to be talking about um, a snow crab, I think. Is that right? Yep. So, we're, about to so we're going to show both a female and a male. And our okay, so I'm first. about to start the video, so remember to un unmute yourself when it starts. All right, so this is our female snow crab. And the first thing we're looking at right here, someone asked this question earlier, are the gills of a snow crab? So crab are kind of like fish in that they don't have lungs like us. They use gills to breathe. So they're using this gill cleaner that I'm poking with the probe right here to basically move water across their gills and then they can pull that oxygen from the water to breathe. So this kind of goopy mustard yellow organ is called the hepatopancreas. That's a big word. And that basically absorbs and stores nutrients. This big organ that you can see right in the center of the crab is the heart. So it's fairly large, but we'll talk a little bit about the crab's circulatory system in a second because they don't have veins like us. So blood is not pumping in veins to the heart. And if you move this heart aside, you can see that this is a female because she's got this, these paired organs. So one of them is called a spermatheca. And the really neat part about snow crab is that they can actually store sperm from the male in these spermatheca. So if there's no male around and she has sperm stored here, she can actually fertilize her own eggs to make little baby crab. That's pretty cool. So you can also tell that this is a female. So these are her reproductive organs, what she basically uses to make babies. So they're called her ovaries. They're kind of H-shaped and they're that, that pale orange color. And when she gets ready to extrude her eggs, they turn really dark orange and they fill her entire body cavity. Pretty cool, huh? So now we're going to switch over to our male dissection and we're going to see if you guys can pick out some differences. One of the most obvious being those um, reproductive organs. Okay, so this is our 
So right away, we can see a lot of similarities, right? Our male snow crab obviously still has um, gills just like the female. So these, um, you might wonder why we had live crab out of the water because they can't breathe when they're out of the water. So as long as the crab's gills are wet, they're still able to pull oxygen from the air onto the water that's on the gills. So that's why we can hold them out of the water for at least a little bit because they still have water on their gills. So again, you'll see this big organ is the heart again. It's pretty large, and if we move that out of the way, we can tell that this is a male snow crab because his male reproductive organ called the vas deferens is this kind of white red with little oval shapes. And those oval shapes um, are basically called um, spermatophores, and those actually contain the sperm that the male can use to fertilize the female's eggs to make little baby crab. So pretty cool, huh? All right. Okay, so I am making you the presenter again, so if you want to put any slides on, you can. So I have a question for you guys. My favorite holiday is coming up, which is Halloween, and I think I'm going to be a vampire this year. So I'm just wondering during that next section, where is all the blood at? Do you guys think that crab have blood? Go ahead and type in your response, whether you think crab have blood or not. Okay, so Isabella is saying yes, they have blood. Cuneo is saying no. Brent is saying no. Mary is saying yes. So it looks like it's being pretty um, evenly split between yes and no about whether they yes. have blood or not. Awesome. And Mrs. Hemphill's so, class is saying yes, but it is not red. Ooh, you guys are smart. And so Mrs. Wood's class says protection. no, because they don't have veins. So they're huh? very <laughs> up on things. So this is a bit of a trick question too. Crab actually have what's called hemolin. So you guys, if you remember this word, I'll be so impressed. So what we're going to do to make sure that crab have he what we call hemolins is we're actually going to try to pull some hemolins out of this crab. Let's see if we can get some out. So this is, I know you guys are going to ask if this hurts. So I basically have a needle here and it's kind of like you were to get a shot. So it'll maybe hurt for a second, just a little pinch and then, um, and then it won't. We're going to see if we can get, ooh, I think, I think they do have blood. I'm getting something. This is pretty cool. You guys want to see it? What do you notice about that? It's not red like ours. And I think a class said that, which was so observant. So crab have hemolin, right? Not blood. Crab have an open circulatory system. So their hemolin basically surrounds the inside of their body cavity. So it's all over the place. It's not contained in veins like our blood is. And they actually have a different pigment in their blood. So that means it's not red like ours. So we have hemoglobin is what makes our blood, our red, or our blood red, and crab have what's called a hemocyanin. So their blood is typically um, blue or um, clear in cases like this. Okay, so we learned about internal anatomy and hemolymph. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I think some of the questions got answered about what color is crab blood because we saw that it was clear or yellowish. Um, and But Maddox had wanted to know what was the slime part in the dissection that you had? Ooh, the slime part there. <laughs> there is a lot of slime. So um, you might have been talking about the hepatopancreas. It's kind of that goofy... Um, people actually call it crab butter, and it's um, it takes up a lot of space in the crab because they use that to absorb all their nutrients. So I would say usually when you dissect a crab, that's probably the messiest part. It's kind of goopy and slimy. Okay, 
Um, and Mrs. Hemphill's class has had wanted to know which crabs, if any, are endangered. Endangered. So I would say none of our none of our, our crab species in Alaska are actually um, so endangered, like you guys learn about endangered species. None of them are actually um, considered endangered. Um, the red king crab is probably an example of what you might call a species that's been declining. So uh, Leah showed you on that map, she circled Bristol Bay, which is a big area where they fish for red king crab. And in the past 10 years or so, their population has just been continuing to decline. So um, this year they opened the fishery, but it was very small because we're kind of worried about these guys. And we want to make sure that we're not taking too many of the males that they can continue to, uh, to reproduce and make baby crabs so that we don't make them endangered or even extinct. And then finally, before we move on to the next section, um, Mrs. Blewett's class had wanted to know if crabs live in packs or by themselves. That's a great question too. So um, red king crab actually love to hang out together. Um, they, what are called pods. Um, so when crab gather up together, they, we call them red king crab pods. And they use that, especially when they're small, as a form of protection. So we saw this little itty bitty tiny red king crab, right? And they, it's a lot, it's a lot easier for them to avoid predators if they can group together in a big pod, what we call. Um, so that it's like safety in numbers, right? So they're a lot safer when they group together. And red king crab and snow crab also, um, you know, form big groups when they mate as well. That's another good question. Great. Well, I know I know that Leah had wanted to give some more information about life cycles, so maybe we should move on to the last section of our yeah. talk. Okay. So now we're going to start looking at specifically at a red king crab life cycle, but really this will apply to any crab. So first of all, what is a life cycle? So let's look at a really simple life cycle. So here's the life cycle of a chicken. Starts out as an egg. The chicken is growing up inside that egg as an embryo. It hatches um, and then grows up into an adult. So this is very similar to us. The baby looks pretty much identical to the uh, adult. It's just a really small version. So a life cycle is just any, the progression an animal goes through throughout its life um, from birth until it's um, ready to reproduce and make the new generation. Now, okay, we and the chicken have a really simple life cycle, but other animals have a lot more complex life cycles. For example, you may have heard about what caterpillars become when they are adults. So caterpillars will become a butterfly when they, um, when they grow up into adults. So you can see that the baby form, the juvenile is a caterpillar, the adult is the butterfly, and they don't look anything like each other. Um, so when an animal completely changes its form from one life stage to the next, this is called metamorphosis. And metamorphose from one animal to another. And can you think of any other animals that undergo metamorphosis? So, and you can type in your answers. Okay, so if you want to type into your question box, if you can think of any other animals that go through metamorphosis. Um, so Sloan is saying moth, Mr. Ward's class is saying frogs, um, Sloan is saying lobsters, Brent is saying beetles. So a lot of insects and amphibians here, spider, frog, maggots, the immortal jellyfish. <laughs> um, yeah, and... those are great answers. Um, I don't believe spiders go through metamorphosis, but all of those others are definitely correct. Um, and also, king crab will go through metamorphosis. So let's start out with the beginning of the king crab life cycle. Um, so king crabs, they started as eggs, 
we already showed you the eggs of this king of the king crab female that we have. Um, remember, we were looking under her abdomen where she has all of her eggs. And if we, if we, um, we're going to go back really quick. And if we zoom in on those eggs, we're able to see inside of them. And you can see those black specks inside of them are actually the eyes of the developing baby crab. Now, when those eggs hatch, um, they will hatch as something called a zoea. So this is a larval form called a zoea. And you can see it doesn't look anything like a crab. It actually looks more like a shrimp. It actually doesn't act like a crab at all either because of course crab are walking around on the ocean floor. They can't swim. But a shrimp or a zoea, a larval crab, is able to swim up in the water. And they don't stay down on the bottom of the sea floor. So larval crab are actually a plankton. Does anyone know what a plankton is? Why don't you write in your answers for that? So what I'm seeing, the answers that I'm seeing in the question box about um, what plankton are is that they are tiny animals. Um, I think that some people were saying that they, uh, they float in the water um, Jacob is saying that it's microscopic. And so I think that there are a lot of different answers about what plankton is. Yeah, those are really good answers. So plankton, um, oftentimes they tend to be very small. They can be plants or animals. We can have zooplankton or phytoplankton. And they're something that is in the water and that can't control its movement against the current. So it's not a very strong swimmer. So it drifts where the currents take it. So that often means that it's very small. However, it doesn't always mean it's very small. For example, a jellyfish can be really big, but it's actually still plankton because it can't control its movements against the current. So larvae crab, the zoea, are plankton. And they're, they, can, they can swim, but they can't control their movement against a strong current. And when, after they grow in the water, they metamorphose into another larval stage called the glaucothoe. Now you can see the glaucothoe looks a lot more like a crab. It can still swim because its abdomen, that flap in the back is out behind it and it can swim with that, but it's um, starting to look more like a crab. And the glaucothoe's job is to find a good place on the seafloor where it can land. And after that happens, it will metamorphose another time into a tiny baby juvenile crab. And these, Tiny crabs look just like adults, and Karen was just showing you them, just a couple here. But we can look at them one more time. So these are crabs that hatched in our laboratory, actually. And they hatched about seven months ago. And so they're just starting to grow up. And you can see the one moving around. I'll try to get you a better look. And so these are young baby crabs. And actually, these ones are actually kind of big. They've had a lot of times to go through a lot of molts that we already talked about. So when crab are little, they molt a lot. When they get older, they start to molt only once a year. So as these crab molt, they will molt many, many times until they become an adult crab that is capable of producing eggs or sperm, depending, if, depending upon if they're male or female, and starting that life cycle all over again. So do you guys have any questions on the king crabs and their life cycle? Let's see. So um, I am just trying to get my questions all set up here. And we did have a question about, um, let's see, about how, how um, long it takes. You had said that those little tiny crab are seven months old. So how long, how, how long does it take those little tiny crabs to get to the size of the bigger one that you were showing us? It would take them up to about, um, well, to get the size, um, I would say about six to seven years um, to get up to the size. That's how long it takes for the crabs to go from babies up to the size that we collect in our, um, in our fisheries. 
um, which are about the same size as that big email I was showing you. Um, we also got a question. Of, um, why are Bree had asked, why are the males bigger than the females? Actually, I think it was Solomon who asked, why are the males um, bigger all, than the females? Okay. First of all, males can grow bigger than the females. They can grow more because they're not having to put so much energy into reproduction, into making all those eggs. But also, a male needs to be bigger than a female um, or close to the same size as a female to be able to, um, to, be able to, to um, breed with them. That's just how the, how the breeding system works. And then Mrs. Blewett class wanted to know if many babies live um, or whether a lot of them become prey when they're, when they're tiny like that. Well, since there are thousands and thousands of eggs and baby crabs, um, lots of them don't make it. If they did, we would be overrun with crabs. So that's the type of um, reproduction and life cycles that crabs have is that you don't expect all of them, all of them to make it. Only a very few lucky ones will make it to being adults. And then um, Anduin had asked, can other species of crabs swim when they're adults? There are a few species of crab. There are swimming crab that can swim as adults. They don't necessarily swim like continuously, but they can, they have, um, their back legs are kind of flattened and they can swim up in the water a bit. I don't know if we have any, I don't think we have any of those in Alaska. Okay. And then Josh had wanted to know why they change, why do they change color between stages? And I was wondering whether that was because, you know, so when we were looking at the tiny crabs, they didn't, didn't have that deeper red color of the red king crab. And I was wondering whether you had any idea about color changes. Yeah, they're still red when they're tiny, but they're just, um, they don't, they're not as dark. And that's largely just because they're, their shell is so thin, we're practically seeing through them when they're little. Um, so they just haven't put on as thick a shell, which the more shell you're putting on, the more pigment also you're putting on. Um, so, and because they're having to molt so many times when they're little, they just have a thin little shell. Okay. And then um, Lily and Ella from Facebook were wondering, does it hurt the crab to open the flap? You know, when you were showing us the eggs, they were wondering whether it hurts to open that or whether it, it's something that's that's more automatic for the, the Yeah, that crab. actually doesn't hurt them. They actually will open up their flap all the time um, because they actually, when they're in the water, they'll have to flap that flap because that brings oxygen into the eggs. So the female actually has to care for those eggs and they flap that flap to bring in new water so it doesn't go stagnant. And then um, Michelle had asked, what is soft shell crab? A soft shell crab is a crab that, that has just really recently molted. Um, so it's shell hasn't had time to harden yet. Okay. Um, and then Kinuyo had asked, does it hurt when the crabs pinch right after molting? The crabs right after molting, the crabs can't pinch because they were, would be trying to pinch with say a pincher made out of jello. So no, it wouldn't hurt and they really couldn't pinch at all. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what, what other questions that we have here. Um, Why don't we open up for questions from, from either of us? Okay. Um, do you guys have any more general questions? So let's see. Um, we have, oh, so Sloan had asked, do crabs have nerves? Um, <laughs> That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, crabs have a essential, yeah, not like we have nerves, but they are able to feel. They have a loose nerve network. Um, but we, that's a good question, and we could we could get find more details for you. <laughs> <laughs> and related to that, um, I suppose not related, but more more um, a question that came out of the um, dissection, I think, is that. When we eat crab, are we eating the muscle of the crab? Oh, good question. Yeah, so when we typically eat crab, we actually are eating the legs. So most of the meat or the muscle tissue is located in um, the legs of the crab, right? So we've got some, some meat that's in the body cavity, 
But as you saw that during the dissection, most of that, um, most of that body cavity is their organs, right? So yeah, when we typically eat a crab, you're probably used to breaking the molds open. Although there is some muscle tissue in the body cavity. And then related and then to related that is, to that, can they, can they grow back their claws after they lose a leg? Yeah, that's a great question. And we look at this particular molt of a crab right here. You can see that one claw is really tiny um, while the other one's really big. And that's because this claw fell off at one point and is starting to regrow. But it takes them many, many molts to get it all the way back up to a full size claw. It gets a little bit bigger every time. And it's the same for a claw or a leg. Okay. And then one last question before we finish up here, because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, Katya from Juno had wanted to know, do, kim, do king crabs live in the Bering Sea? Yes, king crabs definitely live in the Bering Sea. And in Alaska, that's where our biggest king crab population is. Great. Well, um, I was wondering whether you guys want to say anything to finish up here. And because um, we're coming to the end of our time and I don't want to cut people off. Yeah, we just wanted to say thank you to everyone for tuning in and a special shout out to our Kodiak kids. We hope to get to see you in person soon. Um, but we really enjoyed sharing a little bit about our jobs and about crab today. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, and we wanted to let you know that the Kodiak lab in the spring will be doing a lab tour um, Alaska Live webinar. So look for that soon. Bye, guys. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge about crabs with us. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to our NOAA, NOAA Live Alaska webinar. We are very excited to see the information that, that Aaron and Leah had to share with us. And then next week, we're going to be talking about undersea volcanoes. So I will be sending out an email to everybody who um, attended today's webinar. And um, so if you're interested in undersea volcanoes, underwater volcanoes, please tune in. So thank you very much, and we'll see you later. Bye.